Hi, everybody. Welcome um, to the 10th anniversary of the Contra Project. Um, I'm going to slowly get started and hopefully we'll have more folks trickling in um, as we over the next few minutes. Um, but I, my name is Lisa Doy. Um, I'm the president of JCL Chicago. Um, and I've been sort of tasked with doing a quick welcome um, to everybody who's here and thanking you all um, for joining us today to celebrate 10 years of Concha. Um, and I was sort of lucky enough to 10 years ago in June be one of the first uh, groups of people to, to try out this new thing um, called the Contra Project. Um, so there were 10 of us. We gathered at the JACL Chicago office for an orientation. Um, and then we spent several days together, you know, in a really similar program to what it looks like in its most recent form, um, traveling from Chicago to Little Tokyo and Los Angeles, then to Manzanar um, and back to Little Tokyo before coming back to Chicago and sort of sharing a little bit of what we gain from this trip to the broader Japanese American community in Chicago. And together, you know, it was a group of people, some of whom I knew, some of whom I'd known for a really long time, and some of whom I just met um, that day in June. And I think from that trip and from the subsequent um, trips that Kancha has taken, it was a group that gathered to really explore what our shared Japanese American identity meant to us, to learn from the past, and to continue to build community. Outside of sort of like JSL Chicago's Kancha project, one at one point in time, we sort of came across this definition of Kancha that I really liked and wanted to share with this group. So here's the definition. The English translation of Kancha is appreciation, but Kancha has a profoundly soulful dimension with shadings that cannot be adequately conveyed in translation. When a great favor is conferred, it awakens a gratitude so profound as to be endless, an energy inspired by the goodness and connection that is at the root of life, an energy that must be honored and kept alive by passing it not only back to the benefactor, but onward and outward to others in expanding ripples. Kancha puts focus not merely on what happened to Japanese Americans in the past, but on the rights and responsibilities of all Americans. It focuses not on bitterness or self-pity, but on what each of us can do today to prevent such injustice from happening ever again to any group. And I think this really, to me, captures the spirit of the Kancha project as well. Um, and I've gotten to watch Contra grow over the past 10 years and see what are the pieces of Contra that have changed? What are the pieces of Contra that have stayed the same? And you're going to get to sort of see one of those things that changed. Um, every year, Contra has had a culmination project where um, participants have been asked to reflect in some kind of artistic way on their experience and share that back with the Japanese American community in Chicago. But that assignment itself has changed a lot from the first year of Kancha to the most recent year of Kancha. And I think one of the other things about it is you're going to see some projects from alumni that they develop right after going on their on their trips. And you're going to see some projects that were developed many years later. Um, and I think this sort of speaks to the ongoing reflection and sort of um, learning process that has come out of Contra, and particularly the ongoing sort of community building um, and community creating that has come out of Contra. I know for myself, I sort of think about like the whole uh, iteration and reiteration of Contra as, as my own culmination project and sort of being able to sort of welcome new generations and sort of new years of participants into this community as a Contra culmination project in and of itself. But then we're also gonna to get to hear from Rose Masters with the National Park Service at Manzanar. And I think Rose is just one of countless um, people who have made Contra possible year over year. Um, looking around this Zoom, I see Christine, I see Bill, I see Pat, Joyce, Carol, um, Mary, and there are so many more, whether it was sort of initial donors to the Contra project or people who have been able to sustain this um, year over year. And I'll come back and I'll, I'll talk about donating at the end because at its core, Contra has always been community funded. Um, but 
I'm just so grateful to all of you, both of those who are alumni of this program and those who have been longtime supporters of this program, to be able to celebrate this 10-year milestone. It may not be the celebration that we necessarily imagined, but it is still a celebratory moment nonetheless. Um, and I will, I think, hand it over to Veronica um, to do a quick reflection slideshow on Kancha. Thanks so much, Veronica. It was fun to see um, just all those different years um, of the Concha project. Sorry, I'm having a thunderstorm happen where I am, so I don't know if it's in other parts of Chicago. It's, uh, it's in Pilsen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but I am vamping while I try to pull back up the agenda for the rest of the program. Um, so next, we're going to have alumni performances. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Mia to kick us off with the alumni performance period. Oh, yeah. Let me give a quick introduction to who Mia is. Uh, Mia Sato is a one and a half generation Japanese American based in Brooklyn, New York and a Kancha 2019 participant. She served on the Next Generation Nikkei board in 2019 to 2020, and is currently a reporter at MIT Technology Review covering the coronavirus pandemic. All right, it's all you, Mia. Thank you so much, Veronica. And it's so nice to see so many people here that I know that I haven't seen in so long. Um, I'm getting some tech help. So I'll just be like signaling when to, um, pop between, uh, between slides. Um, 
So I'm so happy to talk about my experience with the Contra project today. Um, and I, like Veronica just mentioned, I participated in 2019. And today I wanted to just talk a little bit about representation and truth. Um, next slide, please. So as was mentioned just a minute ago, I'm a journalist. And as a journalist, I spend a lot of time reading and searching for the established knowledge about a subject. Um, so if it's an individual or a company or an event or a place, before I start writing a story, I read everything that has been written about a thing. So I kind of go into it knowing as much as I possibly can. And it was no different when I learned that I had been selected to go on the Concha Project trip. Um, I immediately read as much as I could about Manzanar specifically, and I noticed a pattern um, really quickly that the most used and repurposed images uh, in news coverage about Manzanar were by someone named Ansel Adams. Um, so for folks who don't know, he is one of the most famous American photographers, and he was especially renowned for the landscape portraits that he made. And I actually studied his work in college briefly. Um, and so I had learned about how he depicted the quote unquote wild in the American West, but I did not know, um, I hadn't learned that he had been invited to document Manzanar in 1943 by the director of the camp who was actually a friend of his. Um, Adams also had a personal connection to the incarceration of Japanese Americans, uh, a longtime family acquaintance who was an Issei man in poor health was um, actually incarcerated. Uh, he was taken to a hospital in Missouri and that was very, um, it really angered Ansel Adams uh, when he saw that happen. And so he sort of jumped at the chance to go to Manzanar for a bit. Um, Adams wasn't the only photographer who documented Manzanar uh, in this slide. So Ansel Adams is on the left. In the middle is Dorothea Lang, who was also hired by the government to take photos at Manzanar um, and document the process of incarcerating Japanese Americans. And then on the right is Toyo Miyatake, a photographer who was incarcerated at Manzanar himself and who actually used a makeshift camera to document his time there. Um, next slide, please. So before the trip, um, I really absorbed Ansel Adams' photographs and, I, you know, and coverage of, um, of incarceration using his images. And I became a little obsessed with what he chose to document. Um, many of his photos from Manzanar, and you can actually see them all online. Um, I think there are a couple hundred. Um, but so many of the photographs that he took were actually portraits of the people that were there and the backgrounds are neutral. Um, the frame is really tight around their face uh, and it almost looks like a yearbook photo. And so I found that really interesting. You could, you, you could totally imagine them in a yearbook. Um, other photos document the daily life at camp. Uh, people are going on walks and smiling and playing sports. And, you know, looking at all of these images, I was really troubled, um, not because joy and leisure and dignity while in camp was unimaginable to me, but because these were the primary images that the general public used to understand the experience of incarceration. And these were the primary images that journalists used to describe what happened and to show what happened to the general public. Um, that was where the information was was sort of uh, generated. Um, and, you know, I felt that uh, as a JA, I wanted and needed to see Manzanar for myself and come to my own conclusions. And so before the trip, I bought about uh, four rolls of black and white film. And um, I had my camera, which is not as nice a camera as Ansel Adams used, but it is a film camera. And I had planned to document my trip and develop my film myself and then present it as our culmination project. Um, next slide, please. So ultimately I wasn't able to process my film in time. I underestimated um, how much time it would take. Uh, so I wasn't able to share those photos at, the, at our culmination event, um, but the Concha Project experience was truly transformative to me as a person and as a JA and as a writer. Um, and funny enough, um, you know, I've revisited the photos that I took during that time a lot. And I found myself drawn to photograph 
many of the same things that Ansel Adams did. And so this is a photo that I took of our park ranger, Rose, who's actually here. I, did know, I didn't know she would be here, so this is really cool. Um, this is Rose holding up a picture of a garden that um, Incarceries had created, and she was holding it up in the exact place that it would have been um, up against, you know, what is now the desert. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo that I took of the Sierra Nevada mountain range surrounding the camp. Uh, next slide. And uh, the mountains also are featured prominently in Ansel Adams photos. So this is a photo that of Adams that he took um, when he was at the camp. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this bright white reconstructed basketball hoop was particularly moving and really haunting to me when I saw it at Manzanar. Um, we had learned that sports were a really important pastime for people uh, while they were in camp. Um, next slide. And Adams also photographed sports and leisure activities. This was a prominent theme in his images that he made. So here, um, some incarceries are, are playing uh, volleyball. Next slide, please. And out of all of the photos that I took, um, I was looking back on, on them last week as I was preparing this presentation. Uh, you know, the most important ones to me are the ones that show my fellow conscious participants engaging with the history and with the place that we were in. Um, so this is a photo, I believe, of one of our amazing conscious facilitators, Mari. Um, I think this is Mari. I, it's only the back of their head, but I think it's Mari um, sitting in the excavated park that uh, incarcerated Japanese Americans had built during their time at Manzanar. Um, and I remember taking this photo. I remember the exact moment. Um, you know, we were walking through the park uh, and I was sort of, this was a point in the day where I was feeling, I think the heaviness of the moment and the, the weight of the experience um, that we were all, you know, there to witness, to bear witness to. Um, and the weather was overcast and it was a little chilly um, and storm clouds had moved in and they were kind of obscuring the top of the mountains. Um, and, you know, I was really, I think, wrestling with um, all of the things that we had learned so far and what we were seeing and uh, really trying to process my emotions. And um, I remember looking out sort of, I was alone and just, it was, you know, silent and looking out and I saw Mari sitting on this rock and sort of just looking out in the same direction. And that moment of seeing her there doing the same thing brought immense clarity to me and really like grounded me in the moment. Um, next slide, please. And this is a photo that, that Ansel Adams had also taken of the, of the park. Um, so you see sort of, you know, the, the similarities in, in what is striking, I think, to people who go to Manzanar. Next slide, please. Um, and this is another photo of a participant in the 2019 cohort. Um, this is Aiko taking her own photo of the barbed wire fence at the edge of camp. And I sort of captured that moment. Um, next slide, please. And this photo I think is remarkably similar to that one. Uh, this is a photo um, that Ansel Adams took. Uh, and, you know, as I sort of just tried to demonstrate, you know, in fact, many of the photos that I took, the, the moments that I felt I wanted to save uh, were similar to his work. And it made me consider, I think, holding them up side by side, um, the role of storytelling and the limits of popular representation. Uh, when things funnel down, right, from the person who experienced it, to the person capturing it, to the person writing about it, to the person picking the headline, to the person reading the news. Um, in journalism, we often write to tell other people's stories. The stories we tell are not always our own. And we do many interviews. We pick the parts that feel most important to us. We edit the headlines. We pick the photo to go at the top of the story. And sometimes we use the experiences of others to construct an argument or to draw attention to something that we feel needs to be known by the public. 
Next slide, please. But there is no substitute uh, for the original experience itself. And you know, neither I nor any other reporter or person documenting uh, something can ever fully capture the truth, I think, without having a shared history with that experience. Um, and so, you know, looking back on these photos uh, now and looking back on the photos after I finally was able to develop them after the Concha trip, um, you know, it makes me think of current debates around issues like indigenous sovereignty over historically native lands or reparations for the descendants of enslaved people. And it's striking to me uh, now as ever that these debates often center the opinions of politicians or economists or other experts who don't have that shared history with the issue being discussed. And for me, participating in the Contra Project um, gave me the language to talk about incarceration and displacement and civil rights within a Japanese American lens. And though I'll never know fully the experience of the people in prison at Manzanar, um, I am so grateful for the opportunity to go there and to see it for myself. So, you know, I saw Ansel Adams' photos, but I wanted to go there and see it myself. I wanted to see what I would take away. And for me, it underscores the, import the importance of trusting communities with their own stories um, without having an intermediary to make decisions for them and to funnel messages down and to funnel arguments down. And really those stories should be told by the people who are closest to them. So I just wanted to end on this photo, which uh, is by the photographer that was incarcerated that I mentioned earlier that I think is, uh, you know, I have nothing to add. This is, this is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, it was wonderful to sort of see the pieces that you developed right after and then literally developed with this photography over time and continue to reflect on it. Um, next, we will hear from Sarah. Sarah Pine attended the Concha Project in 2018 and served on the Concha Alumni Board from 2018 to 2020. She is a second grade teacher who works on the North Shore and grew up on Bainbridge Island. She enjoys being outdoors, writing, and helping kids take pride in who they are. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. I also realized I'm still getting used to my own name change, so I guess I'm now actually Sarah Weinstein. Um, I got married this summer, and I'm still not used to that. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to be here. I'll keep my own personal introduction to my piece short, though, because I think my piece speaks for itself. Um, I'm going to read a pretty new um, honestly, pretty unedited, uh, pretty unstructured poem that I just finished recently titled Because of Kanja. Before Kanja, I lived a life focused on my own erasure. I passed as white until third grade when we moved and I suddenly became the Ching Chong girl and my brother, a China man. And I remember thinking, we're not even Chinese. Like that was the problem. But their eyes stayed pulled back until the creases were all anyone could see, laughter rolling, hollering, games. How many people could get away with excluding us? For the record, all of them. And every question I asked about my own identity to my mom, my teachers, myself, seemed only to bring pain or discomfort to all of them. So I learned to stop asking and I learned to start quieting to do whatever and be in the inn of whatever joke made everyone else comfortable with me. I learned to stop existing as anything except what others chose to see in me, pointed at me, asked about me. I didn't have safe spaces to feel affirmed or wonder, and I honestly did not seek them out because I craved whiteness. The kind of whiteness that let all my peers and my superiors just blend into easy. And I wanted so badly to be easy. I wanted to be digestible to everyone, even if it meant I stopped digesting myself. And I thought that was okay. I thought I was okay. I never gave myself the space to be anything other than okay. And so I stayed okay enough for most of my life. In 2017, I was a fresh college graduate who made an impulsive move to a city very new to me and started a job with this guy named Josh. 
And I remember thinking the excitement I held to see another Japanese person at work. I had never, ever seen another Japanese person at my work. And especially not one who was clearly so proud to be Japanese outside of his home, who clearly claimed this part of him and not just with his family, who clearly loved this piece of him, this whole of him in front of everyone publicly. And sometimes I wonder, was it more obvious to him than it was to me that I wasn't claiming that part of me so easily, that I wasn't loving that piece of me so openly, that I didn't even understand or want to know that whole of me easily, or at least not publicly? And I think, yeah, probably. Either way, he invited me to apply to this thing called the Kanja Project, and he explained very enthusiastically what it was and how it gave him the space to be him. And to be honest, I was skeptical. I didn't think I needed that kind of space. I didn't really understand the point of that kind of space. I wasn't sure I wanted to open myself to saying things in a kind of space where I would have to unbury parts of myself I spent years very comfortably, not so comfortably burying. And yet that little piece of me, that whole of me that I buried, which I didn't even know, still had any voice in me, asked me to unpack it, told me to pursue it, told me that maybe just maybe try to hear it in a space where it was welcomed, where it was shared. And so I applied and I got in and honestly, thank God I got in because the Kanja project began a journey, a winding one step forward, two steps back, then three steps forward, only one step back kind of journey where over time I learned to love this piece, this whole of myself. And I got to ask questions about myself with others who had questions about themselves. And in fact, the reasons why I had chosen to hide myself and I learned the history of myself and my aunties and my uncles, my obachan, my mother, and I learned how to forgive myself for erasing myself. The Kanja project created the spaces I needed. The Kanja project surrounded me with people who wanted to understand themselves, who wanted to learn more. And the Kanja project provided the learning and the undoing and the re-loving. And it changed my entire life. And yes, that's cheesy. And yes, it seems kind of impossible that a few days away from home could make me discover a home I had all along. I mean, honestly, even that line is cheesy, but because of the Kanja project, I realized slowly that I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to take this space up. I don't need permission to be seen. I can choose to be seen and I do. I can be me and loud and angry and I can be confused, but no matter what, I can stay proud. And because of the Kanja project, I learned to forgive my Japanese ancestors for the trauma they could not help but pass down. And I learned to forgive my mother for shushing me because she didn't do it because she didn't love me or herself, but because she wanted to protect me, help me be easy. The kind of easy I would have told my own kids to be if Kanja hadn't intervened. Because of the Kanja project, I came to realize my pains, my quiets, they weren't anyone but in my family's fault. It was the fault of a society we grew up in and the systems that asked us, no, forced us to be quiet and easy digestible. I'm not fully healed or fully proud or fully aware yet. These things take time, lots and lots of time, generations worth of time. But because of the Kanja project, I found the strength to refuse being quiet, easy, forgettable, and own the pieces, the holes of myself in every space I enter, because now I feel prepared to claim myself more and more. And I found the strength to try to understand myself because of the Kanja project. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing such a thoughtful and introspective poem with us. Um, Sarah was Mia and my facilitator in 2019 and was an awesome facilitator. Um, next up, we will have Amy Chow present. Um, Amy was a Kansha participant in 2016. Since her involvement with the program, she has served on the ALB and NGN. Kansha has shown her the importance of storytelling and has impacted the way that she creates as a maker. In her free time, she currently enjoys sewing, 
writing, volleyball, and taking care of plants, her plants and animals. All you, Amy. There we go. <laughs> thank you, Veronica. And also thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and I feel a little weird following that up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but today I'm going to be sharing um, my zine that I made for my culmination project back in 2016. Um, and it's basically a, a compilation of poetic, short poetic letters that I wrote to my grandmother who passed away when I was younger. Um, and so it was like a really nice reflection project or reflection um, process for me. Um, Cause most of it was written either at Manzanar or like on the way back. Um, and it was sort of just a way to like communicate just like what I was feeling, what I was going through, like directly to my grandmother who was incarcerated at Manzanar. So let's go, here we go. <clears throat> Dear grandma, I stand here in the desert. The wind whistles loudly in my ear as the sand creeps into the strands of my hair for safekeeping. I look down. My feet are lined with layers of dirt. I stand where you stood. <clears throat> Dear Grandma, I mourn the loss of your life before your death, a suitcase filled with belongings and your dignity as you went off to camp. Three years. They thought $25 and an empty apology was enough, but who told them it was enough? Dear Grandma, it could have been us. With wind whistling in our ears and ankles lined with dirt, it absolutely could have been us. Dear Grandma, they tried to silence you, but it failed. You took three years and put them in your back pocket, took them out when times were quiet and your thoughts were loud. I know your pain quieted your stories, but no, you were never silenced. Dear Grandma, trauma is passed down from generation and generation and I hurt, but I'll take this pain with me to show my kids and my kids' kids where our family's cornerstones lie because they tried to silence us, but it failed. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, it's a it's a beautiful zine. So if you get a chance to see both the poetry and the photography that Amy Amy has, it's really worth it. Um, our final alumni performance is going to be from Emily Harada. Emily. Uh, and I did Concha in 2012, and she also is an alum of the ALB. Um, she plays with Hoatsu Taiko, where she's able to express some of the impact of Concha for her through creativity, and that's what you'll see a little bit of today. So I'll hand it over to Emily. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here, too. I appreciated um, in the beginning, Veronica, when you were showing the presentation, um, it's been 10 years, so it's been a while since I've been uh, in Manzanar through this project, but it's amazing to see how much it has changed over time too, um, as well as some of the consistency, consistency along it. So just, I have a lot of gratitude to everybody that's kept it going, but as well as those who started it for me back in 2012. Um, so uh, just as kind of a background story about what you're going to be seeing, um, when I did the concept project, uh, we did not have the individual creative types of presentation, but we were put into different groups and we would have a theme and we would present like a, a video at the end at culmination. So my group's project was community. And, um, you know, we were given like these little GoPros or some kind of camera and would film things around um, Manzanar, little Tokyo the trip to and from. And I remember on the way back coming from Chicago, all of our video got erased. 
And, <laughs> and so shout out to Kelly Uchima who helped really put everything together. And, and we still had a presentation. Um, it was like, you know, a lot of photos and other types of interviews. Yes, Kelly was so mad, um, but it, it was still a wonderful presentation and example of a, a smaller subset of community coming together to present something. But I want to take another try at it for today. Um, and so with this, this is going to be a focus on community. And um, what you're going to be seeing, the piece is called Yoroshiku, Yoroshiku Onegaishimasu. And in Japanese, that roughly translates um, to thank you for taking me in. Um, thank you for taking care of me, but I too will do the same for you um, in taking care of you as well. And this is usually a greeting, um, but with Hawatsu, we've been actually using it towards the end of a performance. And the reason why is that it's a promise, right, to the people that we're playing or to ourselves, the people making the music, that we will continue to take care of one another. Um, and then we also know that they're going to continue to take care of us too. So um, with that, this was um, another thing about this. It was written by Annabelle Hirano and myself actually during the pandemic. Um, and we were playing it throughout the city um, at like, you know, vigils um, in various protests in front of CCJ. Uh, with Nikkei Uprising. And so it's kind of as an example of the impact that Contra Project has had on me, that I'm still able to apply this idea of community into my, um, my pieces. So uh, I present to you, Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Let's see if I can fully get this share setting going. Uh-oh, sorry y'all. My computer is starting to freeze.
Thank you so much, Emily, and all of Hoatsu for sharing that. Um, it's just been a delight to sort of see from 2012 to 2019, the most recent year that Kancha ran a trip, just the range, um, both the range of reflections and also sort of the similarities and, and through lines that I was able to see across all of those. Um, so our um, our, I don't know, our keynote speaker, our big speaker, and perhaps I was just thinking about this. I think the only person who has participated in all of the trips that the Contra Project has um, has taken, we're going to hear from Rose Masters. Rose is a park ranger at Manzanar National Historic Site, where she leads the site's oral history program. She holds a master's degree in Eastern philosophy and religion from St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Rose grew up in Independence, California. California, six miles north of Manzanar, and first began working at, at the site as a high school student. And I also believe Rose did spend some time in Chicago um, doing some graduate work as well. So uh, familiar with the Windy City. So thanks so much for joining us virtually, Rose. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I uh, didn't know I was the keynote speaker. That sounds um, like something that should make me very nervous. <laughs> I uh, first just want to say thank you to um, the four of you who just did those presentations. That was incredible. Um, and I'm really glad that this was recorded. I hope more people see your reflections and your work and your art. Um, I was moved to tears and like trying to hide it because we're on video during some of those. They were really, really powerful. And I'm really grateful you shared those with all of us. Um, I uh, wrote down some notes of what I wanted to talk about today because I didn't want to forget. Um, so it won't be completely off the cuff. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, I've been involved in Concha um, almost every year. I missed one because I was in grad school. Um, but I felt like I drew the lucky ticket in 2012 when I was assigned to the Concha project tour. I didn't know what it was at that time. My um, boss, so Lisa and I, um, you know, were the people who were uh, going to walk around the site with all of you. And um, I, I probably shouldn't admit this, but we didn't exactly have a plan of what we were, where we were going to go and what we were going to cover. And we let the program in 2012 develop organically out of the questions that the participants had and out of um, the participants' family connections too. I think it was the first time that I had ever um, helped um, people find the barracks locations during a tour um, where their families had lived during the war. So um, afterwards, we uh, all went to a Chinese restaurant down in Lone Pine. Um, that's become one of my favorite annual traditions of um, Kansha. And uh, because I was in my park ranger uniform, I didn't know about dinner and I'm not supposed to go out and like, have a good time and eat when I'm in uniform. Uh, John Tateshi, um, who was, he called himself the driver, but he was with us that year as a special guest. He lent me his sweatshirt. And this was very, it made me feel very funny and strange because um, I had only ever, you know, I, I knew about John through what I'd read about him in books. And I felt like he was somebody who was far too well known to uh, be somebody I should be borrowing clothing from. Um, but it was an incredible dinner. It was really great to get to know everyone and um, to know that this was going to be an ongoing annual project. So my favorite thing about the Concha Tours um, has always been uh, and always will be whenever you guys come back, um, helping people connect to their own family histories. Um, or the, the histories of their friends um, through researching and um, 
providing these historic documents that we have access to at Manzanar to anyone who would like them. And then um, especially, you know, going and um, sometimes having to claw our way through some really overgrown brush, as a lot of you remember, trying to find the locations where the barracks were, the people's you know, families had to spend um, the war living in behind barbed wire. And um, I, I find that to be a really powerful part of the program. And um, it also just, you know, sometimes we think history is in the past, but I feel like in those moments, it's, it's right there in the present with all of us. Um, we can imagine exactly what it would be like to live in that place. Um, I also have had the honor of getting to be the guide for Concha too. Um, which was a real treat, and I hope that will happen again someday. Um, my favorite part of that program, if anyone here is um, from Concha too, um, was when three brothers who were on the program recognized their mother in a big photograph in the mess hall, um, and she was uh, dancing. It was a dance that was being held in the mess hall. And they looked at it and they said, that's our mom. And then they said, but who's that guy she's dancing with? That's not our dad. <laughs> Uh, they were just a really fun group. I, I, I sure enjoy getting to know them better. Um, something that you all have done every year, um, which I'm, I'm hoping you're a little prepared for it by, you know, tromping around in the brush trying to find the barracks locations, um, but you have participated in a service project the next morning um, all over Manzanar, um, from the Chicken Ranch to Block 14, um, helping to remove brush and remove dirt and other debris from some really important archaeological areas. Um, and, um, you know, I, I always talk to the people that you've worked with, like um, Gil from uh, Maintenance and Dave from Cultural Resources, and they always have rave reviews of <laughs> the Concha group because I, I, I'm never with you, but it sounds like you just throw yourselves into these projects, really trying um, to make the most of the time you have um, doing this. So thank you. Um, I'm usually in the visitor center at the time that you uh, come back in and I can attest to your hard work by how absolutely filthy all of your clothes are when you come inside. Um, I guess I, I just want to say, you know, at, at Manzanar, which obviously is a site of terrible, terrible injustice, um, where our country broke its foundational promises to its people, the power of place, of being at Manzanar can be visceral. Um, standing on the soil where the US government incarcerated people without trial, um, many grandmas and grandpas of folks in the Concha project, um, it can bring feelings of deep emotion, sometimes pain. Um, and I think it also can, standing on that land can also build bridges with previous generations. Um, it can help us um, better see the world through their eyes. Um, and connecting to the land like all of you have for the past 10 years, I think it also can bring a deeper understanding um, and also a healing. Um, and so in preparation for this reunion, I, uh, I got on the Concha Project Instagram feed and I went back through it through the years and looked at all of the memories that everyone had shared. And I hadn't seen all of those, even though I follow all of you, I, I hadn't seen all of the things that had been shared. Um, and I also got into um, where I keep all the letters and everything that people send me over the years. And I pulled out all of the letters from Conja participants from 2012, um, all the way through 2019. It was so amazing to read through those and, and just remember everyone. Um, and, you know, I saw in those reflections and in those letters and in what you presented today um, that all of you have really, you felt that power of place of being at Mount Sinai. You, you felt how important it is that we preserve um, that landscape and, and you know, that, that ground. Um, so I wanted to thank all of you for um, all that you've given over the years in learning these stories, 
um, sharing and preserving these stories and preserving these places. Um, and most importantly, for understanding why it's so important that we never forget this, this history, that it never disappears from the American consciousness. Um, I, I've missed seeing all of you the past two years. It's been weird for everyone, um, but it was definitely a big disappointment when you all had to cancel for 2020, but a wise choice. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to whenever they say you can come back. Um, I always am sitting on the steps outside the visitor center waiting <laughs> for the van, the concha, the concha mobile, I guess, <laughs> to pull up. Um, and I remember, um, you know, the first few years, Christine would be like texting me like, okay, we'll be there in 20 minutes. Okay, no, we'll be there in 40 minutes. <laughs> Um, but I always have felt after 2012, even though it's always a new group of participants that come, um, I have uh, always felt like I'm sitting on those steps waiting to see a group of old friends. Um, and I um, look forward to when we can do that again. Um, you have an incredible program. I know I only see a little slice of it, um, but what I've seen you know, that's been shared online, it looks like um, you all do really important work. So thank you. Please keep doing it. And please come see us again um, someday. <laughs> thank you so much, Rose, for being our keynote speaker. Um, Rose has been such an instrumental part of the Contra project over the past 10 years, um, guiding groups of participants through Manzanar every year. And even though I was like a late, I was on the last cohort before COVID in 2019. Yeah, I really felt that power of being there. Um, and you helped a participant find where her grandparents were incarcerated. Um, and yeah, these are things we will never forget. Um, so now we're going to hear reflections from Christine, the person who founded it all. Um, and for a little background on Christine, um, she worked in the JICL Midwest office for seven years, where she supported the Chicago chapters operations and youth programs. She is one of the co-founders of the Contra Project and served as a troop facilitator from 2012 to 2016 and was the advisor to the Alumni Leadership Board. All right, Christine. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Rose, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your reflections. Um, yeah, you have been such a constant in the program and um, it's also really been a exciting to see the way Manzanar as a historical site has grown and expanded. Um, and I feel like each year there are pictures of new things that have been excavated or um, rebuilt. Um, so thank you for your continued work in that. Um, yeah, your expertise and your knowledge and your generosity in sharing that with us. I'm so, so grateful for it. So thank you for being here. Um, and Mia, Amy, Sarah, um, Emily, thank you for sharing your gifts um, and your reflections. Um, I think you do such a, it's such a beautiful illustration of the impact that Kancha has. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, what I was asked to talk about is um, on the individual impact of Kancha, talk a little bit about the community level impact of Kancha, at least that I've been able to observe. Um, I think it's something that I maybe didn't anticipate and maybe it was foolish to not anticipate, but I feel like there's just been this blossoming of a vibrant, um, young adult Japanese American, um, or Yaja, as some of you like to call it, um, community in Chicago. Um, and I think at the risk of sounding like a cranky old timer, um, when I started working at the JCL Chicago office in 2009, um, there really weren't any other young people around. And I use the term young very loosely because if you were under 40, you were considered youth. Um, and there were very few young people around. Um, there weren't any youth programs or like opportunities for sustained engagement at the local level. 
Um, and I think that maybe around 2010, 2011, um, there were like five people in their mid twenties, um, including me and Brian Hara, who is now my partner, <laughs> um, who tried to just get like a young, um, young social, young professionals type group going. Um, but to be honest, it really was not very successful. Um, it was mostly like me and Stephanie Nitahara sitting at a bar together, waiting for like all the random people we invited through Facebook to show up and usually no one showed up. Um, so it was, it was rough. It was, a, it was bleak at the time. Um, and I think when that really started to change, um, it started to change, I think, with the introduction of the Kancha Project in 2012. Um, but more than that, I think, is when the Alumni Leadership Board was formed in the fall of 2015. Uh, and when I think back to that time, it was just this like perfect storm um, of lightning in a bottle, like the perfect storm of circumstances. So uh, we had Bill Yoshino um, and John Mathaishi, who'd already been mentioned, who they were just like tired of driving a rental minivan across the desert for like six hours with like seven people shoved in the back. You know, they were ready to retire from the program. Um, so we need to find a new way to transport people, um, find a Kancha mobile, I guess, um, and think of a new way to start facilitating and running the program. Um, and at the same time, there was also this core group of Kancha alumni um, from the first four years of the program at that point who had graduated college and were moving back to Chicago and were like looking for a way to get involved and a way to give back. Um, and the ALB presented that opportunity because there were, really wasn't anything else. Um, and so from 2015 through 2020, which was when the ALB was running, um, you all showed up, right? Like the folks who are part of ALB, um, many of you are here today. I feel like half of you are all ALB members, at least. Um, you took the Concha project and transformed it. So you already heard about the change from the, um, I think it, it wasn't even GoPro cameras, it was like flip cams that they don't make anymore. So like those group video projects to the individual creative projects. Um, we had like all these unique fundraising campaigns. Um, you all worked on local coalition building efforts um, and just brought this really unique focus on arts and activism to the program that wasn't there before. Um, so, you know, the project is better because of your ideas, because of your involvement. Um, and I'm just really grateful that there were enough alumni who were committed to, um, committed enough to provide out literally hours and hours of labor um, to keep this program going because we cared about it so much. And um, I think even beyond the ALB, what the Kancha alumni community has shown time and time again is that there's just so much creativity and energy and brilliance and passion amongst all of you and this desire to um, this desire for sustained engagement and a commitment to social justice that exists in our community. Um, I think sometimes the narrative around young people in the J community is like, oh, they're not involved. Where are they? They don't care. And I just, you know, you, you all have disproved that, like blown that myth out of the water. And it's I'm just like oh, so overwhelmed with gratitude for the way you all have shown up in that way. Um, and it used to be that the ALB was the only like major way for young folks to get involved with JSL Chicago. So I think there was one year when we had like 15 or 20 people in the ALB because everyone was like, well, yeah, what else are we going to do? Um, and since then, I think we've been lucky to see so many other opportunities and spaces for youth um, to grow and to thrive, um, both on the board, but also Next Generation Nikkei, Nikkei Uprising, um, Sudu for Solidarity at the national level, and other community organizations within Chicago. Um, and I think what's been extra exciting is that young Nikkei leadership in Chicago has grown beyond just Kancha alumni um, and has brought in so many other amazing young folks who are ready to help shape our community's present and its future. Um, on a personal note, um, as a mixed race Shinike from the East Coast, um, I didn't have family in the camp. So when we were developing the Contra project, it was really important for me um, personally to make sure that the Contra project provided like a pathway um, into a community that maybe felt inaccessible or like distant or removed, um, and also built a sense of agency and ownership 
over our community's legacy and its future. And over the years, I think it's really clear how that sense of agency has translated into the way that Kancho alumni have claimed their place as artists, as activists, scholars, teachers, caretakers, organizers, and leaders in our community within your own right. Um, so I'm really excited to see the next iteration of what the Kancha project looks like um, as it continues to evolve and continues to serve the growing needs of our community. Um, but more than that, I'm just really hopeful and inspired to see what comes next for our community under the care and under for care uh, and stewardship and involvement. Um, we've really come a long way from when no one would show up to a JCL Chicago youth event. Um, and yeah, I'm just continuously so grateful for the way that you show up um, in your full humanity and all the like diverse spaces and communities and networks that you're a part of carrying this legacy of the Kancha Project with you. Um, so yeah, as I think of the next 10 years of the Kancha Project and beyond, um, it's just really satisfying to know that the program and our community is in all of your hands. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I just, I guess, want to piggyback off one of the things that you you mentioned. You know, I think that a lot of what the um, young Japanese American community in Chicago looks like today, whether or not it's Contra alumni, has been shaped by having this big cohort of Contra alumni who can get involved and who are involved. Um, and I, I, um, I think about just when. I, you know, I grew up in Evanston, but came back to Chicago, and I came back to Chicago at exactly the right time um, to be able to be part of this community. So I'm going to close us out, and I want to um, talk about three things. Um, so the first, um, you know, I think this has just been sort of a great expression of, of gratitude and recognition for all of the hard work that goes into the Kancha project. Um, and I mentioned at the top that Kancha is community funded and including our alumni who've been um, great financial supporters of the Kancha project. The program costs us, JSL Chicago, about $1,000 per person. Um, and I think as the chapter president that that money is very much worth it. Um, and it also means that we have to fundraise to make sure that this program can continue. Um, but one exciting thing is um, you can now make monthly gifts um, or recurring donations to the Contra project. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat um, to where you can donate um, and set up a recurring gift if you wanna give you know, a small amount of, of money each month if you're able to, or you can give it um, quarterly or annually. Um, we, yes, finally have this ability after many years of people asking for it. So you can scroll down on that page to a place where you can um, give a recurring gift. And I'll also send that out um, by email. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention, I get to hopefully not prematurely make some announcements about Contra 2022. Um, so we did not run a trip in 2020. We did not run a trip in 2021. Um, but please cross all your fingers and toes and get vaccinated and wear masks. And hopefully we will be able to run two Contra trips in summer 2022. Um, one of the commitments that I think the chapter wants to make is that anyone who sort of aged out of the program in the years we didn't run the trips would still continue to have the opportunity to go, which means that when we do it again, the upper age limit I think will be 27 or 28. Um, but then we also sort of want to kind of catch back up to the few years that we missed. Um, so please keep an eye out around January of 2022 on the JSL Chicago website um, for an announcement about the application. Um, and if you know of anyone, you know, between 18 and 27 um, who would be interested, identifies as Japanese American and would be interested in attending, um, please help send them the applications when they're available. We also, I think like, I'm going to just guess on these dates, like March 10th, 2020, an announced that we were going to do Contra 2. Um, and within like 
the first week of putting out that application information, we canceled the trip. Um, so again, hopefully in 2022, um, we will also be able to reprise the CONCHA 2 program, um, which is a program that's not age specific. Um, so anyone who's interested in traveling to um, Little Tokyo and then Manzanar is welcome to participate in that program. So again, hopefully spring of next year, we'll have more information about that and check our website. Um, so for the last you know, 15 to 20 minutes, um, we wanted to spend some time in breakout rooms by year. Um, and I also know we have some people who did not participate in Contra, so maybe we can make a, a breakout room for those folks as well. Um, but before we go into those breakout rooms, I wanna give um, a huge thank you to back to all of our alumni performers, to Rose for joining us, um, and to Christine and Veronica who put this program on with me. Um, it's just been a, a delight to work with all of you. And I neglected to introduce Veronica at the top. So I just wanna give a big thank you to Veronica Marishige, um, who's JSL Chicago staff person, and who's also a Concha alum from 2019 um, and will help really steward this program going forward. Um, in 2022 and beyond. 